You know, Alan said he talks to a patient about breathing and they said to him, what have you been smoking? I've been 55 years old, you think I don't know how to breathe? I'm still alive? Well, the answer is barely. So that's something to think about. The average person breathes around 30,000 breaths a day, which is astounding. 10 million breaths a year. Could you imagine doing something repetitively 30,000 times a day? And yet we do. Well, if one or two of those breaths are off balance, any problem? How about if all 30,000 are out of balance? Problem? Yeah. So noses are made for breathing, okay? The nose is a four-stage filtration system. It's got hairs which trap the floaty stuff. The enzyme in the mucus is called lysozyme. And lysozyme kills viruses and bacteria. So the hair goes in over the air goes in over the hair, through the mucus, over the turbinates, which are your radiators, through the sinus. The sinus produces two liters of water a day. Can you imagine one of them big bottles of water a day produced by the sinus? Why? Why do the sinuses make so much water? We go back to physics here, Boyle's law. If you want two gases to cross a permeable membrane, the membrane has to be moist. The gases don't traverse a dry membrane. So the role of the sinuses here is to moisten the air so that the membrane of the lungs remains moist. Now where do those two liters of water go? Who wears glasses? How do you clean your glasses? <sighs> so the bulk of the moisture of those two liters is in the exhaled breath, which keeps the oral cavity, the nasal cavities all nice and moist, washes the air before it goes into the lungs. Your fourth and final fine stages of filtration are your adenoids and your tonsils. And let's stop for a moment and go back again to what we said this morning. Um, Alan's talking about the collapse of the, and of the nostrils when you inhale very quickly. Is it possible that if the nose is congested, that you will get a collapse because of the congestion as well, and not only because of lack of patency. So I have a question. Does anybody have a blocked nose? Come here. We're going to unblock that nose. Gloria, where's that Dremel? <laughs> no, no, forget about it. All right, what I'd like you to do is go and stand at the wall. We're going to unblock a nose. I'm not licensed to touch anybody, so you're safe. All right? So I want your mouth closed. I want you to breathe as gently as you can through your nose. I then want you to take in a little breath, let the air trickle out, pinch your nose close with your fingers, don't breathe, walk up to here and back again. You got it? So gentle breath in, let it trickle out, pinch your nose, keep your mouth closed and walk. No breathing. Turn round and go back towards the wall. Turn round now, come towards me. Release your fingers, put your hand over your mouth so that you don't mouth breathe and breathe gently in and out through your nose. What's happening? It's better. Okay. Easier? Okay. Thank you so much. What did we do? Why was her nose blocked? It was congested. It was congested because I'm watching you. Your mouth opens and closes and opens and closes and the CO2 levels are fluctuating. Well, hypocapnia is a bronco and vasoconstrictor. So as the CO2 levels dropped, so the very vascular lining of the nose started becoming congested. That little bit of exercise made some carbon dioxide, because that's where it comes from. So you built it up in your body, you then kept your mouth closed, 
you exhaled the CO2 rich air over the congested vascular lining of the nose and it opened. James. But we can get nasal congestion to improve just by forcing somebody to only mouth breathe for a minute. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm worse than Alan. You can also get improvement in nasal congestion just by not breathing through your nose for a minute because oftentimes the turbulent airflow is causing, uh, yeah, oftentimes. Yeah. I mean, so sometimes people are congested in the nose just because there's already decreased volume. The air has to move in faster, more turbulent, speeds up the airway, but also dries it out. Yes. So simply, the other, the confound in what you just did is there was also 30 seconds where she didn't breathe through her nose, having nothing to do with carbon dioxide. So she could have stayed in her seat, breathed through her mouth for 30 seconds, just her mouth, and she would have experienced an increase in nasal vacancy just from that. So it doesn't have to be entirely carbon dioxide immediate. Well, you'll get a better result because of the nitric oxide production in the nose. And nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator. So by initiating some nasal breathing as well, you also get that little spurt of nitric oxide which helps. And a lot of people discount or don't even know about the effect of nitric oxide as a vasodilator and a bronchodilator. So as I said, nothing is ever right. Different things work. Different things work for different people. But that's a perfect example how something really simple and non-invasive can give you quite a spectacular result up front. Now, Alan, I'm going to cross swords with you again. I never tell people to tape their mouths shut. Ever. I say to them, how are we going to keep your lips together? And let them tell me that they're going to tape their mouth shut. It's very subtle. But if I say to a mother, I want you to tape your child's lips, the mother says, no way. If I show her that little Jimmy sitting with his mouth closed is doing better than little Jimmy with his mouth open, I'll say to her, how do you think we can keep Jimmy's lips together? And she looks at me and I pull out a bulldog clip. And she says, no. And I say, uh, chin strap? She says, no, why don't we use a piece of tape? And just do that, please. It's going to save you so much trouble in having to try and, and defend that nobody dies because they're breathing functionally through their noses. It's just a little tip that comes over a period of time. So we're talking about Vernuli and, and Venturi. Sounds like two of the menu items on last night's dinner. It was nice dinner. It's a good place, that. Okay. Have you noticed that in both those formulae there's V for velocity? Well, if you don't diminish velocity, you are going to exacerbate the collapse. And I don't know too many people who focus too much on the volume of air being breathed. It's important. What is snoring, apart from being a pain in the butt? It's a vibration. And if you want to relate it to a window with vertical drapes, and the windows open, the drapes will flutter. And if you close the window, the drapes won't flutter. We've reduced the flow of air. In the same way, with a portion of snoring, one of the effects, or one of the things that affect snoring, is the movement of too much air causing a vibration of the tissues. If we get the minute volume down and there is less air going and the windows closed, it works better than having to cut out the drapes. Right? That hurt, didn't it? That U triple P was a pain, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe it's not fun. Yeah, all right. So can you see now, we're looking at a whole variety of things. Let's look and see what happens. Why do children get inflamed tonsils? Why? All I ever hear of all these conferences I go to, and believe me, there are lots of them, treatment of choice for OSA in children is T's and A's. Get rid of them. Never the question of why did they become inflamed in the first place? Well, if you breathe through your mouth, you make your tonsils, which are filter number four, 
you make them filter number one. And all the stuff that should have been trapped in the hairs, in the mucus, in the sinuses, all goes down and gets inhaled directly into this microfine filter. It's a trash can. The brain's got a contract with a cleaning company called the Lymphatic System LLC. And the lymphatic system has to constantly go on its route, clearing out the trash cans. It doesn't have a pump. Lymph moves through muscle movement. Your prime muscle for moving lymph is your diaphragm. Mouth breathers don't use their diaphragms. So you've got this double whammy. You've got this child breathing through the mouth, overloading the tonsils. They become inflamed, they become infected. There's not a lot of lymph moving, and there's nothing to clean them out. Okay. Controversy time. I've had several patients over the years. Children have been booked in for tonsillectomies, adonectomies. I've said to the mother, wait three weeks. Check with your ENT to see if your child is going to survive another three weeks. Give us three weeks to get the mouth closed, to adjust the posture, to get the tongue position moving, and to get the diaphragm pumping. And let's see if by reinstating that lymphatic flow, we're able to start to reabsorb some of the toxins from those tonsils. And in probably 90% of the cases, after three weeks, the tonsils have reduced back to normal size. The child is a nose breather, no more bedwetting, no more chronic nonsense in the morning, dragging them out of bed. So many other little complaints have cleared up just by getting the breathing rhythm back to the way it should be. All right, so who's that guy? Ever seen him? That's Dr. Seuss. And I love him, so I wrote something for him in appreciation. And it says the hairs and the nares and the mucus up the nose. That's where the dirt and the nasty stuff goes. The turbinates turb and the air gets treated. The sinuses flow, that's where the air is washed and heated. Breathe through your mouth, the, well, the tonsils and the adenoids, the filters microfine, bouncing ball. Are the very last in the four stage battle line. Breathe through your mouth and you suck in all the dirt, overload the fine filters and they really start to hurt. Cut back on the flushing because you're breathing from your chest. They all get infected and the surgeon does the rest. <laughs> and the kids learn this. And they love it and they come into class and they recite it. <laughs> okay. And then we say, why does that happen? They say, because I'm breathing through my mouth. <laughs> It's really, you know, the question was, this is tied in with allergies, etc. Um, please remember that everybody is sensitive to allergic triggers. The trigger only makes you overbreathe, depending on where your breathing trigger is set. So if you're a really robust breather, and you're sitting up at 40 millimeters, and you get a couple of cat's hairs up your nose, it doesn't bother you. But if your trigger is hair fine on 25 or 26 millimeters and you get a hair in your nose, it will react instantaneously and you will have that allergic response. So we find a large amount of allergies disappear by themselves when we get the kids back <clears throat> to a functional breathing level. Suddenly they can play with their pets again and they don't have to take the marigolds out of the house. Nothing is finite. Some cases, yes. Other cases, no. But all we can do is we can go on the, the basis of probability, which is what we do in most of these cases. <clears throat> so now we get real technical. What's in a can of soda pop? Water, salt, sugar, coloring, flavoring, and? CO2, carbonated beverage, right? So it's a stonking hot day and you've been running around like a hairy goat and you pop a can of iced sparkling something, isn't it great? Full of fizz and life and energy and zing and sparkle and bubble. It really is, it's terrific stuff. Drink half the can. 
put it down and come back an hour later. What's it like? Okay, flat. No zing, no sparkle, no fizz, no bubble. What's it lost? It's fizz. It's fizzless. What's blood made of? Exactly the same stuff. Water, salt, sugars, colouring, haemoglobin, flavouring, that coppery taste, cough, coppery taste. Okay. And CO2 under pressure, 40 millimetres mercury pressure. Lose the fizz out of your blood and how do you feel? Flat. No life, no energy, no zing, no sparkle. Does it make sense? How do you lose the fizz out of your blood? You breathe through your mouth. You move your breathing up to the upper chest. You start breathing fast and shallow and short, sharp breaths. And the air never gets down to the base of the lung so that when you exhale slowly, you can drop the CO2 back into the reservoir before you exhale the excess. This is not complicated. Well, if you continue to breathe short and sharp and up here, your breathing rate is going to rise. Because in order to try and get as much of that as possible, if you're starting off with a lower amount, you have to breathe more times to move it around faster. You've got a 100 gallon drum and you've got a 1 gallon jug, it's 100 trips. You've only got a half gallon jug, it's 200 trips. And then it becomes a loop gain system where the more you breathe, the faster you breathe. The faster you breathe, the more CO2 you drop. The more CO2 you drop, the faster you have to breathe to move the residue around. And eventually this is what happens and you become a normal breather for you. But that doesn't mean functional. So why do we overbreathe? Nice question. Why do we overbreathe? You've got 50-50, you've got phone a friend and you've got to ask the audience. Okay? Do we overbreathe because of chess? Mess? Finesse? Or who wants to hazard a guess? Stress. The only thing that changes our breathing pattern is stress. Because stress puts us into fight or flight, fight or flight gives us an initiation of adrenaline, adrenaline is a stimulant, and our breathing pattern is going to change. It's, it's, it's not difficult. I don't want to spend too much time talking about fight or flight here because it's a very complex thing. It involves an enormous amount of physiology and biochemistry. Except the fact that if you're in fight or flight, you are going to overbreathe. It might be small, it might be medium, it might be large, it might be sustained, it might be periodic. But if you are stressed, your breathing pattern is going to change. So how many kinds of stresses are there? Hundreds. What I've done is break stress into three groups. We call them functional stress, we call them ingestional stress, and we call them emotional stress. And what is functional stress? It's how you sit, how you stand, how you talk, your occlusion, are you in pain, how do you function, do you talk really fast, do you sit hunched up over a computer behind the wheel of a car, are you a truck driver? What are you doing functionally that is stressing your body? The second lot is what are you putting into, onto, and around your body that puts things into the body where the body says, this is inhospitable, I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. And how does the body get rid of things? You cough, you sneeze, you vomit, you develop a diarrhea, you develop skin outbreaks, boils, uh, uh, emphysema, eczema, psoriasis, all of these things. This is the body trying to get rid of stuff. Who remembers what's the body's largest organ? Skin. Do we rub stuff on our skin? 
Do we slather our kids in petrochemical sunscreen? Do we lie in chlorinate at swimming pools and brominate at spa baths? You think we don't absorb that stuff into the skin? Through the skin into the body? So look at the ingestional stresses in your life. What do you inhale? What's around you? Are there cleaning materials? Are there detergents? All of these things come into our questionnaire when we look at, at occupation, where we look, we have to be detectives when we do this to find out what are the base causes of stress. And of course, the third one is not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. How do you function in the 21st century? How do you cope with the things that go on? Do you intuitively react and mess it up? Or do you take a moment, step back, and create a solution? A bit of trivia. The word create, the word react, they use the same letters. Just depends how you arrange them. So I want you to do some Scrabble breathing in the future. You keep this little bunch of Scrabble tiles in your hand and a situation arises and you think, okay, am I going to arrange them to make react or create? You are welcome to react if it's your choice. Most people say, I had no choice, he drove me crazy, he drove me up the wall, she pushes my buttons, the kids get under my skin. Smart kids. They can get under your skin, subcutaneous children. It's not your kids who drive you nuts. It's your response to what your children are doing that drives you nuts. You see the difference? So if we don't start to look at these different kinds of stressors and do something about them, we don't stand to hope. This is a series of photos taken of kids who've come into my clinic over the last few years. What hope does this one stand? Huh? Look at that head position. Look at that exhausted mouth open. What, what, what health future does she have unless we intervene? <clears throat> and just look at all of them. You're going to see quite a lot of cases of retained neonatal reflexes in these children. The parents don't even notice it. The parents do not know how their children stand because they see them at home in the same environment in front of the same curtains. And when you take a picture of their children, they say, my child does not stand like that and they're standing next to you. This kid's going to fall over. Why is he standing like that? You see the toes, you see the fingers curled, you see the forward head with the open mouth. It's a solid, chunky little boy that he has. At that age, he has no flexibility. He's standing like this. He is rigid. Mother said, my child doesn't stand like that. I said, nope. I took his photo and I photoshopped it, took his head off and stuck it back on the side. <laughs> she said, why is he doing that? I said, because he's out of balance. Nothing wrong with my child. Isn't he cute? Learning problems, attention deficit problems, snoring problems, enuresis at the age of 11, goes to bed in nappies. Whoa, something really interesting on the floor in front of me. <laughs> Look at the kyphosis and lordosis on that little girl at that age. She's 10. That's a boy. His older brother wanted a sister and the mother didn't produce. So he dresses the younger brother up in girls' clothes because he wanted a sister, and the parents are quite cool with that. They think it's quite cute. Look at those knees locked. If he was a boat, he'd be rolling and pitching and yawing all at the same time. Isn't that your typical tired child? Huh? The mouth breather, the bags under the eyes, the listlessness. Look at her seated position. That was a fascinating case. That's a little boy in Barcelona. This was at Barcelona University. 
He was in the Department of Orthodontics. They'd been treated there for the last two years. Now I went to lecture there and they said, can you please use him and show us what you can do? And I'm not going to go into that because it was quite a long one. But look at that posture. Any wonder he's got an occlusion problem? So we come back to the question about how does the brain respond if it's sensing a constant lack of CO2. It tries to use as much as it can. If it's limited in what it can use, the next thing it can do is to try to limit the amount it loses. And were you, you know, were you to water your garden and you've got some established plants and some seeds? You don't want to blow the seeds out of the soil, so what do you do? Put a kink in the tube. Does that reduce the flow? Brain's a bit of a gardener. So all the brain does is it puts a kink in the tube. It takes the hollow organ that's surrounded by bands of smooth muscle and it just kinks those bands of smooth muscle to reduce the bore of the tube to make it harder <coughs> for us to exhale. Bronchoconstriction. Do you think it only stops at the bronchioles? Where else do we have tubes in the human body? Like everywhere? It's just a bunch of calamari on two feet, that's all we are. Nothing happens in the human body that doesn't go through a tube. Well, can you imagine if we're going to get bronchoconstriction? <clears throat> you think we won't get vasoconstriction? You think we won't get spasm in the smooth muscle tubes in the digestive system, in the reproductive system? What is the bladder? The bladder is a tube. It's a hollow organ. It sits like this and it has stress sensors up here at the top. And as the liquid rises in the bladder and moves towards the stress sensors, you get the urge to void. If you overbreathe, the bladder goes into spasm and the sensors come down and they meet the level of liquid wherever it is. And if you're lucky, you wake up. And most adults do wake up. Most children are sleeping so deeply that they don't pick that trigger. That's why they wet the bed. You get a bedwetting child to nose breathe. In most of the cases, the enuresis disappears. It's not a complicated thing. It makes common sense. Well, if the narrowing of the tube doesn't work quickly enough, the very next thing that we have is a breath hold. And that's what we discussed a little earlier. You want more oxygen flow to the brain. You're doing something that requires your focus. You hold your breath. The CO2 rises. It buffers the blood and it frees the oxygen. During the day, it's called a breath hold. At night, it's called apnea. Apnea, no breath, Greek word. Go ahead. How does oxygen travel around the body? It goes by train. It goes on the hemoglobin express, okay? So picture that you have these two little locomotives sitting in your lungs, going chug a lug a lug. Behind each locomotive you have millions of carriages. And each carriage is a molecule of hemoglobin. Inside each molecule of hemoglobin you've got four heme ions. Under the correct conditions, wow, this is really awful with this. Under the correct conditions, which means that the pH in the lung needs to be 7.45, and you need to have your 21% of oxygen passengers present. When you have that, those doors open, and one oxygen passenger will hop onto one metal seat, lock itself down, and you will then have, I'm going to stand here and see if it helps. I don't know, it's one of us. Is that better? There's not so much feedback? Sorry to do that to your camera, but you need some audio as well. Okay. So you then end up with, uh, with a molecule of saturated oxyhemoglobin. Can you put five passengers into there? Six, seven, eight, ten, no standing room. 
So this business about I want to breathe faster or deeper to get more oxygen or I'm short of oxygen is a load of nonsense. So once you have all of those carriages loaded with oxygen and you get to the station <clears throat> where those characters have to be released from the carriages, somebody has got to get inside there, unclip the chemical seat belts, open the doors and kick the passengers out. It's like the train stops here. Who does that on a train? Somebody called the conductor? Yeah, how do you spell conductor? And those conductors live there. And if you've got less than 35 of them, they don't do that. So what happens is you land up with carriage after carriage after carriage loaded with oxygen. Nowhere to go. Is there anybody in this room who has slept an entire night through and woken up tired the next morning? Or anybody who hasn't? Why? You've slept for eight or nine hours. Your body should be rested. Why are you still tired? You're tired because you did not get that release of the oxygen from the hemoglobin. Because you were over-breathing, because your CO2 levels were dropped, and because it kept on going round and round the hundred miles of, of blood vessels in your body, never getting off to do the job that it should. So my question is, if all of these things here, that is your functional, that's your ingestional, that's your emotional trigger, that's your upper chest breathing, that is your minimal diaphragmatic function, if all of those things conspired to land up in this situation, do you think it's possible that by changing that we can get that to go back there? I think it's possible. I'll tell you something, at pushing 74, if it wasn't possible I wouldn't be here. I'd be salmon fishing in the Yemen or doing something. Yes, it is possible. And all we need to do really is re-establish diaphragmatic breathing, get the nose closed, start to teach people breathing exercises which is going to reverse the trend and say to the trigger, no, it's no longer 30, it's now 32, 34, 35, 36 and eventually it goes back and resets the breathing trigger to a functional level. So what I did was I got my secretary to go into the filing cabinet. I said, close your eyes, I don't want you to pick any favorite patients. And draw for me 30 files at random. <clears throat> she brought me 30 files. And it ended up as 19 females, average age 33, 4 males age 30, 3 boys at age 9, 4 girls age 8. And we put them through exactly the same evaluation. Their end tidal CO2 was 28.59. Their average breathing rate per minute was 21.35. 97% of them were mouth and chest breathers. On a score out of 10, where 10 is the worst, when asked, uh, sorry, that thing has dropped, disturbed sleep, 8.43. Nighttime toilet trip, 7.8. Waking energy level 9, um, daytime sleepiness, overall assessment of the way they felt was 8 plus out of 10 lousy. So we put them through a three week breathing training program. At the end of that, ETCO2 39.02, breathing um, 40, uh, 40 39.02, optimal, um, breaths per minute 9. 92% of them were nose and diaphragmatic breathers and, oops, 0 0.6, 0 0.26, 1.2, 1.1, 2.76, 96% of people reported that after that they felt great. Is that a clinical trial? Is it? Would it qualify for peer review? Huh? If I gave it to you, you'd probably sh nod your head and say that's good. It wouldn't make thorax. It wouldn't make lancet. It wouldn't make Cochrane. 
Does it mean it's not valid? Does it not mean for those 30 people and the thousands of others that I've taught over the years who've come back and said, as they've said to Alan, you've given me back my life again. Do you think it affects them? Do you think they are interested in whether this made it to a Cochrane Review or to a, a journal? They only know that they have a life back again. So we've all seen people like that, haven't we? Anxiety, panic attacks, open mouth breathing, crooked teeth, anger, retrogonathic mandible, snoring. They all have angry tubes. They all have sticky blood. They're not functioning the way they could function. These people are different. Little gappy tooth, smile, peaceful, nice open tubes and fizzy blood. So current medical practice focuses on the symptoms attached to the person. It's symptomatic treatment. Doctor, I'm not feeling well, let me examine you. You have this and this, here's a prescription, or we put you in hospital, or we do a test. Why don't we also look at the patient attached to the symptoms? Why don't we start to look for influences on why? And that is what integrative practice is. It's working together with colleagues across the board, each acknowledging that we have a role. And for all of us to understand that if we do what we do to the best of our ability, in harmony with other people, we will get a much better outcome. So with that in mind, I created something called Berg Education. And Berg Education is based on the iceberg, where 10% of it is visible, and the others are underlying factors. And we have a family. And it probably has more to do with the things we don't see than those which are patently obvious. And we have a toothberg, where general dentistry looks above there. Integrative dentistry looks there. We have a sleepberg. Current sleep focuses there. We'd like to focus here. We have a jawberg. Where's the jawberg? The way we sit and stand and walk and sleep, we have a jawberg. We have a stressberg. So we're building up the Berg education family so that when you talk to your patients you can hold up a thing and say you've been looking here, we look down here, does it make sense? Okay, so I don't have an enormous amount of time. I do have in my office a bowling ball on a stick and I get people to hold that and say that's the weight of your head and they don't believe it and you can see the incremental effect of that How many homes have the right size chair for children? Not a lot. Children are expected to sit in adult chairs. Look at them with their mouths open. Look at them sitting at an adult table in an adult chair. How many of them have a reasonable posture for growth? Important things to look at. So it's important to remember the body's 11 independent yet interdependent systems. We need to be conscious of all of them. And I've distilled what we do into three steps. Teaching people to breathe the right amount of air per breath, the right number of breaths per minute using the right mechanics. And for right, replace it with appropriate, because there is no right. CO2 is essential to life. It's very important for us to be able to measure it, simply, effectively, efficiently, non-invasively. It's great to have objective visual detail and data. You can say to somebody, that is your breathing pattern, that is a functional breathing pattern. And of course the same goes for so many things. I don't have time to go into detail. It's taken 15 years to develop this program. It's a two-part turnkey package. And the first part of it is an assessment. We provide you with an assessment kit, which has got everything that you need to do the assessment. That gives you breathing efficiency, it gives you sleep efficiency, it gives you biochemical balance. This is not a sleep study, it is not a sleep test. This is just to see that the body, how efficiently the body is working. We get some really nice outputs, we get this cardiopulmonary coupling, which shows you that really good quality efficient sleep is these peaks, and inefficient sleep is these peaks. It's not a sleep study, we're not diagnosing. We're getting somebody to look at it and say, I can see I'm not functioning as well as I could function. 
Okay, so there's your graphic representation. We do posture as well. This is a great little app. This is called Snorlab. And it actually, you put it on the bedside table next to you. And it records every single sound through the night on a scale with timing and all kinds of little factors. And it gives you your quiet moments and it gives you your noisy moments. We have a retraining program which is in a box, it's a kit in a box, it's all the steps. It's the functional, it's the nutritional, it's the emotional, it's the body strengthening exercises. The whole thing is a system to follow. It looks after these three groups of stress. It's a team approach, it's done as a multidiscipline team. This does not include the dentist personally having to do anything. We do full training, hands-on training, and we get increased outcomes, uh, you get certificated. It's an additional income stream for a very small outlay within your practice. And the writing is on the wall. The current way of treating sleep is changing. We've heard it this entire weekend, it is changing. It's not possible for any one discipline to handle every facet of sleep. Nobody owns sleep. This proposed ruling that only doctors should be allowed to have anything to do with sleep, which was mooted as to coming out of the AASM. Uh, it's not going to work. It's not going to fly. Because nobody owns it. There's no room for status or position or egos. The most important person is the patient. And optimal patient care isn't an option. It's mandatory. And that is the end of the story. Thank you so much. Questions? Where do you keep um, out of? What organization? Is it the Buteyko organization? Or? There isn't a Buteyko. The question was, who do I teach with? Which organizations? There isn't a Buteyko organization. There are half a dozen groups of people around the world who each claim to own it. It's a mess. Okay. I teach practices. I train practices in-house. I come and I work with you and I establish the routines within your practice. Depending on where you are geographically, if you have an OMT in your area, we integrate her into the whole thing. Optimally, we would like to have a resident. The same way as no dental practice today worth its salt would not have a hygienist. We believe in the future, in addition to hygienists, there will also be people who are trained to do this. And they could very well be the hygienists because they are the best trained of all. Across a whole scope of things to do with jaws and tongue and musculature, etc. They have a really good starting point as opposed to lots of other people. But at the moment that's what we do. I can't remember anymore. Okay. <clears throat> what do you want it as an intro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you? Right, just in case you didn't know, my name is Roger Price. Okay? <laughs> I was born and raised in South Africa. I've spent the last 32 years in Australia. I am now a resident of Scottsdale, Arizona, as from six weeks ago. I started my career as a pharmacist in the mid-1950s. I moved from that through... Uh, physiology, pharmacology, forensics, toxicology, anyology, anyopathy I've had a go at. And I've now specialized in respiratory physiology and that is what has brought me to this particular point. Enough? Perfect, thank you. Done.